So we shall therefore um, begin for the three people in this room who probably have heard me talk about Ben's fabulous book but have not yet looked up his bio. He is an author and a media scholar. Um, he is not just the author of the book that he'll talk about today, but also of this book that yeah. just came out, right? Mm -hmm. Just came out. Keywords, yep. um, where he is an author and an editor. Um, and I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, uh, we have a copy of this book at the SDS Center. Actually, both of them will be in the SDS Center. So, um, so feel free to go and find them and read them. Um, he has recently been appointed Associate Professor of Media Studies. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that means, he got tenure, which is a big deal, yeah. <laughs> at the University of Tulsa. Uh, but he also remains affiliated fellow at the Information Society Project at Yale University. Um, he comes from the American Midwest and he has held fellowships at Harvard, um, Hebrew and Columbia Universities, uh, where he earned his PhD in 2010. And we are very, very glad to have been here as uh, this kind of the opening lecture of this uh, small little workshop um, that we're uh, doing on um, topics related to data in the internet, especially in the Soviet context. And tomorrow, uh, Ksenia Tatarchenko and also myself and one other speaker will present. His name is, I just forgot, Andrei Safronov. Alexei Safronov. Um, so without further ado, uh, welcome Ben. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, hearing more about your book. Marvelous. Well, thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, and those who are watching, but fewer is more, and I look forward to uh, a lively discussion. Uh, Так что большое спасибо, Диане, и тоже Ольга, которая не здесь, но большинство организаций, и я благодарен ей тоже. Это, кстати, на тему того, что если вы не хотите задавать по-английски вопросы, потом да. Бен готов да. отвечать по-русски. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, transfer to English and also say that I'm going to give the bulk of my lecture today. I have a prepared kind of dramatic distillation of the book, the shortest possible rendering of it that I can give, and then I hope our conversations will break forth into lively and controversial conversation later on. So, right. Um, so let me let me just plow forward uh, with with the story, and then we can see where, if anywhere, it takes us. Okay. So um, on the morning of, uh, and this is what the book looks like. You've already seen it. Okay. Uh, there it is. So on the morning of October first, nineteen seventy. The computer scientist, Viktor Glushkov, walked into the Kremlin to meet with the Politburo. He was an alert man with piercing eyes rimmed in black glasses, with the kind of mind that, given one problem, would seek a method for solving all similar problems. And at that moment, the Soviet Union, it seemed, had a serious problem. A year earlier, the United States had launched the ARPANET, the first packet-switching distributed a uh, computer network that would in time seed the internet as we know it. Uh, this distributed network was initially designed to nudge the US ahead of the Soviets, allowing scientists and government leaders computers to communicate even in the event of a nuclear attack. Here you can see Paul Barron's uh, initial reports um, and the word survivable um, is, is kind of key to that. It was the height of the tech race and the Soviets, it seemed, needed to respond. Glushkov's idea was to inaugurate an era of electronic socialism. He uh, named the colossally ambitious project the All-State Automated System, and it sought to streamline and technologically upgrade the entire planned economy. The system would still make decisions by state plans, not market prices, but it would be sped up by computer modeling to predict equilibria before they happened. Glushkov wanted smarter and faster decision-making and maybe even electronic currency. All he needed was the Politburo's purse. But when Glushkov entered a room much like that cavernous room that morning, he noticed two empty chairs at the long table, perhaps not unlike this. 
his two strongest allies were missing. Uh, so instead, he faced down a table of ambitious, steely-eyed ministers, many of whom wanted the Politburo's purse and support for themselves. So between 1959 and 1989, leading Soviet men and women of science and state repeatedly ventured to construct a national computer network for broadly pro-social purposes. With the deep wounds of the Second World War far from healed, the Soviet Union continued to specialize in massive modernization projects that had transformed a dispersed Tsarist nation of almost illiterate peasants into a global nuclear power in the course of a couple generations. So after the Soviet Union's uh, leader Nikita Khrushchev denounced Stalin's personality cult in 1956, perhaps a sense of possibility swept the country. And onto this scene entered a host of socialist projects to wire the national economy with networks, computer networks. Among them, as best as I can tell, the first proposal anywhere in the world to create a national computer network for civilians. This idea was the brainchild of the military researcher Anatoly Ivanovich Kitov. What a Kita. Kitov. A young man with a small build, you can see him on the right there, the arrow, uh, and a keen mind also for mathematics, Kitov had risen through the ranks of the Red Army in the Second World War. Then, in 1952, he had encountered uh, Norbert Wiener's masterwork, Cybernetics, uh, from 1948, in a secret military library. The book's title, A Neologism, coined from the Greek for steersman, and a post-war science, cybernetics, a post-war science of self-governing information systems. So with the support of two senior scientists, Kitov translated cybernetics into a robust Russian language approach for developing self-governing control and communication systems with computers. The supple systems vocabulary of cybernetics was intended to equip the Soviet state with a high-tech toolkit for rational Marxist governance, an antidote to the violence and perhaps cult of personality characterizing Stalin's strongman state. Indeed, perhaps cybernetics could even help ensure that there would never again be another strongman dictator, or so went the technocratic dream. In 1959, as the director of a secret military uh, computer research center, Kitov turned his attention to devoting unlimited quantities of reliable uh, calculating processing power, um, his words, to better planning the national economy, which was perhaps the most persistent information coordination problem besetting the Soviet socialist project. It was discovered in 1962, for example, that a census error, a handmade calculation error in the 1959 census, had goofed the population prediction by about 4 million people. So Kitov wrote down his thoughts in the Red Book letter, which he then sent to Khrushchev, he proposed allowing civilian organizations to use functioning military computer complexes, for the word network, uh, for economic planning in the nighttime hours, when most mi military men would actually be sleeping. Here, he thought, uh, economic planners could harness the military's computational surplus to adjust for census problems in real time, tweaking the economic plan nightly if needed. He named his military civilian com national computer network the Economic Automated Management System, which later preceded this one, the Dinai Gesundarsenai Svetvichi Slit Micht Centrov. So as it happened, Kitov's military supervisors intercepted the Red Book letter on its way to Khrushchev, and they, his supervisors were in fact incensed or enraged by his proposal that the Red Army share resources with civilian economic planners, resources that he at the same time dared to describe as falling behind the times. So a secret military tribunal was arranged to review his transgressions for which Kitov was promptly stripped of his Communist Party membership for a year and then dismissed from the military permanently. So ended the first national public computer network ever proposed. The idea, however, survived. In the 19, early 1960s, another scientist took up Kitov's proposal, a man whom Kitov would in fact glow, grow close enough to that decades later their children would marry, Viktor Mikhailovich Glushkov. Uh, 
So the full title of Glushkov's plan, uh, the all-state automated system for the governing and processing of information for the accounting, planning, and governance of the national economy, USSR, speaks for itself and its epic ambitions. First proposed in 1962, the all-state automated system, or OGAS, Sistema, was intended to become a real-time, remote access, national computer network built on pre-existing as well as planned telephony wires. In its most ambitious version, uh, it would span most of the Eurasian continent, mapping itself like a nervous system onto every factory and enterprise in the planned economy. Its network was modeled hierarchically after the three-tiered pyramid structure of the state and economy. One central computer center in Moscow would connect to as many as 200 mid-level computer centers in prominent cities, which would in turn link to as many as 20,000 computer terminals distributed across key production sites in the national economy. So, consonant with Glushkov's greater life work commitments, the network plans reflected a deliberately decentralized design. This meant that while Moscow could specify which users received which authorizations, that in fact any authorized user could contact any other one on any node in the pyramid network without direct permission from the mother node. Glushkov personally intimately understood the advantages of leveraging local knowledge uh, in network designs as well as elsewhere, having spent so much of his own career as a mathematician working on related problems in set theory while also ferrying between his home and the central capital. He, in fact, jokingly called the Kiev-Moscow train his second home. He spent so much time on it. The Ogas project appeared to many state officials and economic planners, especially in the late 60s, to be perhaps the best next response to an old conundrum. The Soviets, of course, were agreed that communism was the way of the future, but it seemed that no one, perhaps since maybe even themselves, Marx and Engels, knew quite how best to get there. So for Glushkov, network computer, networked computing might just inch the country forward towards what the author Francis Spufford has later called the age of red plenty. And if you don't know this novel, I warmly recommend it. It is very well written and hilarious. Um, it's also like based off of a lot of really good history. It's an interesting kind of historical bit of fiction. Uh, buy that book first before you get mine. That's how much I like it. It was the means, these networked computing were the means by which the sluggish pulp-based lifeblood of the command economies, you know, think quotas, planning, wrist-bending compendiums of industry standards would be transformed into the nation's neuronal firings, right? moving at the sublime speed of electricity. The project signified no less than the ushering in of what they called electronic socialism. Such ambitions required brilliant, committed people willing to throw off the old ways of thinking. Um, and in the 1960s, those people could be found throughout the Soviet Union, well, in many places. For example, here's one place. Uh, here on the outskirts of Kiev, Glushkov ran the Institute of Cybernetics for 20 years, beginning in 1962. He filled his institute with ambitious young women and men. The average age of researchers was about 25. Uh, never went too much more than that, too, too higher than that. Glushkov and his youthful staff dedicated themselves to developing the OGAS, as well as a series of other interesting cybernetic projects in the service of the Soviet state, um, such as a system, in fact, of electronic receipts for virtualizing hard currency or money into an online ledger of accounts. And this, mind you, in the early 1960s. Glushkov, who is known to actually talk down communist party ideologues by quoting paragraphs of Marx from memory, which I think is a great technique, described his innovation, this e-currency as it were, as a faithful fulfillment of Marxist prophecy, of a moneyless socialist future. Uh, unfortunately for Glushkov, the idea of a Soviet e-currency stirred up unhelpful anxieties and didn't receive committee approval in 1962. Fortunately, his grander economic network project did live to see another day. So these 
uh, cyberneticists imagined a kind of, let's go back to the network, a kind of smart neural network, a nervous system for the Soviet economy. This choice cybernetic analogy between computer network and brain bore its imprint on many other computer theory innovations there in Kiev and elsewhere. So for example, instead of uh, focusing on what's called the von Neumann bottleneck, or which limits the amount of transferable data in, in a transistor, uh, Glushkov's team proposed what they called macro piping processing, uh, which was modeled after the simultaneous firings of many synapses in the human brain. Um, in addition to countless mainframe computer projects and other, um, some other theoretical schemes included, uh, there's automata theory, the paperless office, equally fit for businessmen and bureaucrat alike, and natural language programming that would let humans communicate with computers semantically, not just syntactically. So for example, the statement, the chair sits on the ceiling, would be recognized as nonsense by a computer. It's quite a ceiling. M most ambitiously still, Glushkov and his uh, team theorized what they called information immortality. A concept that, uh, at least in English, we might call mind uploading with Isaac Asimov or Arthur C. Clarke in hand. To give you a sense of that, uh, on his deathbed decades later, Glushkov comforted his grieving wife with a resonant reflection. Be at ease, he soothed her. One day, the light from our earth will pass by constellations, and on each constellation we will appear young again. Thus, we will be together forever in the eternities. That's not what he meant by information and immortality, but it's a pretty good start towards how the naturalizing material base of Soviet cybernetics lays some really interesting philosophical work for this type of analogy making. So after the workday, the cyberneticists indulged um, in a comedy club, club full of frivolity and merry prankstherism that bordered on the outright outlandish. No more than a place to vent off steam, their after-hour work club also saw itself as no less than a virtual country, independent of Moscow's rule. They christened their group here Kibertonia, Cybertonia, at a New Year's party in 1960, and they organized regular social events, such as holiday dances, symposia, conferences in Kiev and Lviv, even publishing tongue-in-cheek papers such as on wanting to remain invisible, at least to the authorities. And instead of event invitations, the group issued pun-filled passports, wedding certificates, newsletters, punch card currency, and even a Kibaratonia constitution. So we can come back to these later if you want. In a parody of the Soviet, Soviet uh, council governance structure, Cybertonia was governed by a council of robots, at the head of which stood this, uh, their mascot and supreme leader, a saxophone playing robot. A nod, I think, in some sense, to the cultural import of jazz. So uh, Glushkov himself is interesting in this situation. He titled his memoirs, Despite the Authority, even though he was also himself a vice president of the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences. I think counterculture, understood in the scholarship of Fred Turner, that's the book on the left, where this book uh, came out of, um, you can understand counterculture is the power to count and counter other powers. And I think this has long been kin of cyberculture. These ambitions, however, required money, and lots of money, especially for Glushkov's Ogas project, and that meant, again, convincing the Politburo to give it to them. So it was again, that Glushkov found himself in the Kremlin on the 1st of October, 1970, hoping to continue the work of Cybertonia and to bring a kind of internet to the bedraggled Soviet economy. At least one man stood in Glushkov's way, the Minister of Finance, Vasily Garbuzov. Garbuzov, it seems, did not want any shiny, real-time, optimized computer networks governing or even just informing the Soviet economy. Instead, he called for simple computers that would flash lights or play music in hen houses to stimulate egg production, as he had seen during a recent visit to a farm in Minsk. Uh, 
His motivations were not born out of a common saint's pragmatism, although it seems that he wanted the funding for his own ministry. In fact, rumor holds that he had approached the economic reform-minded Prime Minister Alexei Kasigin in private before this key October 1st gathering, threatening that if his, Garbuzov's, competitor ministry, the St Central Statistical Administration, retained control over the Ogas project, then Garbuzov and his Ministry of Finance would internally submarine uh, or sabotage any reform efforts that it might try to bring about, just as it had done to Kasigan's piecemeal liberalization reforms five years earlier. So Glushkov clearly needed allies to face down Garbuzov and to keep this, this sense of a Soviet network alive, but there were, it turns out, none at that meeting. The two seats left empty that day were the Prime Ministers and the Technocrat General Secretary, Leonid Brezhnev. These were perhaps the two most powerful men in the Soviet state, as well as likely supporters of the Ogas. But they chose, for reasons we can get into if you want, to be absent rather than to face down a ministry mutiny. In the end, Garbuzov successfully convinced the Politburo that the Ogas project, with its ambitious plans to optimally model and manage information flows in the planned economy, was too much too soon. The committee, after nearly going the other way, felt it was simply safer to support Garbuzov, and the still top-secret Ogas project was left to languish in review limbo for another decade. On a bigger picture, I argue that the forces that brought down the Ogas resemble those that have eventually undid the Soviet Union, that is, the surprisingly informal forms of institutional misbehavior. Welcome. Here are a number of people who uh, uh, took issue with the Ogas. Subversive ministers, as we've discussed, status quo inclined bureaucrats, nervous factory managers, confused workers, and even other economic reformers, uh, uh, liberal uh, reformers in particular, opposed the Ogas project because it was in their institutional self-interest to do so. Thus, without state funding or oversight, the National Network Project uh, for ushering in a kind of electronic socialism again splintered in the 1970s and 1980s into a patchwork of dozens and then hundreds of isolated, non-connected, non-interoperable factory local area control systems, or very like local area networks. I argued the Soviet state failed to network their nation, not because it was too rigid or too um, top-down in design, but because it was too fickle or pernicious in practice. And there is, I think, an irony in this. The first global computer networks took root in the United States thanks to well-regulated state funding and collaborative research environments while the contemporary and notably independent national network efforts in the USSR floundered due to unregulated competition and institutional infighting among bureaucrats. Thus, the first global computer networks emerged thanks to capitalists behaving like socialists, not socialists behaving like competitive capitalists. In the fate of the Soviet internet, I think we can glimpse, to jump to today, a clear and present warning about the future of the internet today. Today, the internet, understood as a single global network of networks for advancing informational liberty, democracy, or commerce, is in serious decline. Uh, uh, consider how often companies and states are willing to silo their online experiences. The ubiquitous app, the thing that occupies all of our smartphones in our pockets, is more of a walled garden than it, for rent seekers than it is a public commons for browsing. Inward looking gravity wells such as Facebook or the Chinese firewall, perhaps Yandex, we should discuss the local situation, increasingly gobble up sites that link outwards. So too, we can quite understand reasonably do the heads of France, India, Russia, and many other countries are eager to internationalize ICANN, or the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, and to in fact enforce local, local regulations for their citizens, something I fully understand. In fact, hundreds, we should note, of non-internet networks have been functioning across corporations and countries for decades, but only recently are they being 
given any attention. I believe that the future of com uh, computing networks undoubtedly holds not one internet, but many distinct online ecosystems. In other words, the future undoubtedly resembles the past. The 20th century features multiple national computer networks clamoring for global status. The Cold War drama of what we might dub with a wink the Soviet networking, or even in the delightful title of historian Slava Gorovich, the Soviet internet, helps to fill out the comparative study of computer networks with a sort of internet negative 1.0 case study. So weighed in the balance of many past and likely future networks, the perception that there is only a single global network of networks is precisely the exception to the rule. Given that the Cold War irony at the heart of this story, at least as I've glossed it today, that there were cooperative capitalists outmaneuvered competitive socialists, did not play well for the Soviets of yesteryear, perhaps we too today, here, elsewhere, should not be too sure that the internet of tomorrow will fare much better. Here's a theoretical uh, uh, reflection. The anthropologist and philosopher Bruno Latour once quipped that technology is society made durable, by which I think he meant something like social values are embedded in technologies. For example, Google's page rank algorithm, uh, the thing that determines your order of your search results, it is deemed so-called democratic, unquote, because among many other factors, it counts links. Uh, and links to sites making links as votes. Thus, like politicians in a democracy, the pages with the most link votes ranks the highest. So in this guise, we, the West, I think, has in particular, has tried to render the internet into a vehicle of its own values, of liberty, democracy, and commerce. But it has done so precisely at the moment that the internet was itself cemented in the popular imagination of the triumph of those Western values in the wake of the Cold War, the early 1990s. And so I think the internet, the Soviet internet story that I've begun to tell here today actually helps us reverse Latour's af af um, aphorism. So too is society, technology made temporary. In other words, as our social values shift, so will what appears obvious about technology. As I've described today, the Soviets once embedded values into computer networks, cybernetic collectivism, status hierarchy, planned economies. These things may seem foreign to, that, to us to some degree. So too will the values that modern readers attach uh, to the internet strike future observers as strange. Network technologies will endure and evolve, even as our fondest assumptions about them pass into the dustbin of history. Finally, Glushkov's story is also a stirring reminder to the investor classes, to the research classes, and to other agents of technological change that astonishing genius, far-seeing foresight, and political acumen are not enough to change the world. This is obviously the story that Silicon Valley tells itself all the time. Supporting institutions make all the difference. This is an express lesson of the Soviet experience and a media environment today that is continuously mined for digital data or for other forms of privacy exploitation. Indeed, the institutional networks that undergird the making of any computer network, where the past or present and their cultures are not only vital and far from singular, but demand our critical attention. While computer network projects and the promoters will continue to pedestal, no doubt, brighter networked futures publicly, I believe that private institutional forces will, unless checked, continue to capitalize on surveillance networks committed to making themselves privy to our lives. And perhaps that's what the word privacy is really about. It's not about our capacity to defend our sacred spaces as individuals, but rather the capacity of institution, information omnivorous institutions, to kind of cannibalize or make themselves privy to our lives. Uh, and so the Soviet case study, I think, reminds us that the U.S. National um, Security Agency's domestic spying program, or Microsoft Cloud, or many other information projects, participate in a much longer 20th century tradition of general secretariats committed to privatizing personal and public information for their own institutional gain. <laughs>
In other words, we should not take too much comfort from the fact that the global internet first evolved thanks to cooperative capitalists, not competitive socialists. The story of the Soviet internet is a reminder that uh, we internet users today enjoy no guarantees that the private interests propping up the internet today will behave any better, any better than did those um, forces whose unwillingness to cooperate not only spelled the end of Soviet electronic socialism, but perhaps threatened to end the current chapter of our networked age. Specific. So we have um, plenty of time and opportunity uh, for discussing um, this uh, exciting presentation, both in terms of presenting the content of the book, but also looking forward towards thinking about uh, um, various forms of networks that we live with today and various forms of the digital that we live with today. Um, so I'm going to see if there are questions yeah. or comments or things we want to discuss. Because hmm. I have lots of things I could discuss. But, <laughs> but I see yeah. Senior. <laughs> senior, <laughs> just yeah. Yeah. So actually, like, before we go into the international yeah. Yeah, no, it's not. already did it. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Because I was reading to sort of the sum of it. Right? Yeah. And I'm very, very excited about how it's evolved into what we see today, right? Yeah. So it's like this process is what you call the distillation. Mm -hmm. And so what sort of some of the mist is if you do go into the book, right? There are many more stories not only that we yeah. only get there. Yeah. So that's actually like, it's, it's This is the Hollywood hard, trailer. Right? Yeah. So this kind of part of the region is what you award, right? But so, can you just like walk us a little bit through how did you get interested in this story? Yeah, sure. Right? And sure. Then how did you make your choices in the end? So how you would structure the book? Yeah, sure. I'd love, I'd love to do that. And I would also, when it comes around, I'd love to hear what, where you guys are at, and if if this kind of description could be helpful, I'd be glad to conspire. Thanks. <coughs> so there's multiple origin stories that one could tell for this book, right? One one possibility is to say. Um, I remember as a 20-year-old, I was standing on the bank of the Volga River in Balakova. I don't know if you've ever been to Balakova. It's in Pavorzhia. Um, and uh, I was struck in this kind of quiet, quaint, small town, maybe 500,000 people, um, rolling green hills. Uh, and oh, I was, on the, I was overlooking a sunset, right? This, the, the sun was reflecting off the uh, uh, river in front of me. And I was just enjoying the picturesque moment. Um, and it was at that moment that I was also struck by something, I mean, a kind of mismatch. Um, because I looked around, I opened my eyes a little bit, and I noticed that there was also something a little strange about this city. Um, I was at the bank of the Volga, and in front of me was a giant reservoir uh, with a hydroelectric station that, whose dam stretched over a kilometer in front of me, like a massive, massive thing. On the horizon, I could see four nuclear power plants with two more that had yet to be built. They were not completed in the 90s. If I turned to the right a little bit, I saw a series of abandoned military factories where, if you believe the taxi drivers anyways, uh, they're like once the, uh, what's the cosmonaut uniform material was made, a kind of really robust material was manufactured in a secret military factory. So strong apparently that napalm would ball up and roll off of it. Pretty cool. Um, and I was just struck at that moment by like the mismatch, right? The, uh, somebody clearly had decided that this quaint little town in the, not in the middle of nowhere, but basically the middle of nowhere should become a powerhouse, should become an, have an industrial oversized um, uh, role to play for powering that local region. And I just wondered as a 20 year old, who decided this? Where, where does this planning instinct come from? What kind of institutions must exist for this place to make sense? Um, I think it was things kind of the longer genealogy of the project is um, um, and when I was doing my master's at Stanford in a uh, graduate seminar with Fred Turner who is marvelous and whose book you should also read before mine it was this one uh, yeah. yep. yep so this this book came out the year after I took his seminar and 
the book on the left is a story of the Silicon Valley, basically, um, the West Coast uh, relationship in the between the Cold War and the counterculture and the rise of, of um, cyber culture. And I thought this is an amazing Cold War story, but Fred, uh, where's the other side of the Cold War, right? So I, I, you know, there there was no non-American um, uh, story, and obviously there was one, so I wanted to go tell it. And then I remember another moment when the project kind of clicked, the, at least the question clicked into being, like I could articulate it, was when I was reading in the footnotes of a popular biography of Norbert Wiener, um, the founder of cybernetics, as I mentioned, uh, that he had visited Moscow in 1960 and had given a series of lectures, blah, blah, blah. And that's, he received caviar for his royalty payments, by the way, which was, I thought, a super cool moment. Yeah. Caviar. Um, I, I like that. He got paid in caviar. He got paid in caviar. Um, uh, so preempting the whole end of the Soviet Union, but in very, you know, Russian posh <laughs> ways rather than. Very just, curious. You know, getting paid in jam and uh, cement. So, somewhere, anyway, long story short, somewhere in the footnote, uh, there was a CIA specialist, a Russian specialist, who was wringing his hands about the rise of the, what the Soviet cyberneticists were excited about, some Yedinna Informat. Information set, right? And I was like, oh my gosh, of course, of course, the Soviet cyberneticists would have been working on a network. This is contemporary with the ARPANET. Why don't I know anything about this? Where was the Soviet internet? Right? Where was this? Is the height of the Cold War tech race. We've got nuclear races, there's computer races, there's chess, there's you know, everything. Where's the computer network story? And so that threw me. Kind of headlong into this long dissertation pursuit of the story that I've just reduced. Um, and then it went on and it didn't become a book until um, I had received a job and needed to get tenure. <laughs> and for tenure you need to have a book <laughs> in my department so these things happen. Um, uh, and then the distillation is an interesting relationship, actually, like my changing relationship to the book after its publication. Um, I no longer own the text, and I'm actually much more interested in hearing how you guys might reread the story I've told you. Because one of the things I've really come to enjoy as an author is finding my own story changed, right? Finding it reinterpreted, put to new work, put to new places. That I think is the greatest thing. So, particularly if you have a critique, I would, I would love it, but not necessarily. So I don't know. Does that give a, a bit of a narrative arc? Um, yeah. If I was to say that, of course, about the others and how you know all this big network, which is available to everyone, and how it's going to be used in the Yeah, that's great. I'm sorry. What, what was your name? Uh, Anna. Anna. Yeah, later. No, no, no. It's great. That's, this is even better. Come, come for the fun stuff. Um, uh, that's that is really interesting. Um, so, I mean, I think in a general way, I would answer that yes, I think Yandex is part of a nationalization of a network, right? Um, but it's and I think this is not unique to the R Russian language areas. Um, and in fact, it's not unique to any particular language areas. I think the internet is becoming increasingly, mm, what's the word I want? Not ghettoized, but like not siloed, but uh, walled off, uh, right? There's, there's ways that uh, we don't encounter one another. Um, uh, given whatever the interfaces we choose are. So, um, but I don't, let me also say clearly that I don't think that's a bad thing, actually. While I was kind of critiquing it today, I think it's quite possible that we can imagine, um, I don't know, you'll, you'll have to tell me about whether Yandex and its moves are good or bad or whatever, but I would propose that as a historiographical pr experiment that we think about the multiplicity and the variety of networks is actually a healthy thing, a way of making us have a broader, richer, counterintuitive imagination for what networks can be, but right? I just yeah. Need to, uh, <laughs> interrupt you there. Yeah. So, what would be the scale of variety in this imagination? 
Because they're saying, oh, okay, maybe this linguistic or national communities are like, representing the variety. Mm -hmm. So what about if they become the human threat and so what we are losing right. these small units? I'm just like, so yeah. can you just put it on the scale somehow? Sure. Well, let's start with things that actually exist. So like early on, we could look and talk about different networks that aren't the Orgas, right? And there's not only the ARPANET or the Orgas, but there's also really interesting concrete attempts early on to build networks. And these very early networks are really interesting because they are both different from today, as well as moments of their, they participate in their own moment. So like, if you don't know the CyberSyn story, um, uh, in under Salvador Allende in Chile in the early 1970s. It's a completely fascinating story of a national network that's being built for explicitly national purposes, including the uh, socialist regulation of, of a, an economy um, and a state. Um, and it's being done so in ways that participate in its own cybernetic moment, in its own Chilean culture, in the gendered propositions of who does what labor in the political and history of its moment. I think we could, you know, just broadly, the long list of emerging network stories is, is it's pretty big. I mean, there's stories of hackers in um, apartheid uh, South, South Africa or really interesting Canadian uh, groups that are trying to build their own use nets or of course the Minitel in France uh, right which was in some degree successful um, even though failure and success really isn't the story here so I would just propose to answer that question I would begin empirically with what exists in history and then imagine from that what different trajectories can we how can we cut the available networks we see today in different ways how can we reorganize what we encounter linguistically, culturally, nationally, um, using some of the counter stories that the early network history may propose. I don't know if that makes any sense. Is that as a... No? Well, okay. No, 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 because I just do it. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> if you were to speak, it's going to be too long because I can talk about the story yeah. over yeah. here. Because I'm talking about Andy Russell's book, so... But, but, I mean, okay, yeah. This is kind of weird. Awesome. <laughs> И пожалуйста, не стесняйтесь, если можно по-русски тоже. Вот, 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 Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering whether, you know, normally, normally the parallels that I draw are those between the Russia and China because uh, governments cooperate and, you know, the Great Chinese Second War and everything. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of those major technical transfer uh, points for the countries. Uh, I'm wondering whether, uh, whether this is the same or similar, there is a similar trend mm -hmm. that you would, uh, uh, that you would observe Know, yeah. In the States or elsewhere, yeah. where where the state is, you know, wrong and regulating, but also regulating in a way that is being discussed in society, whether it is regulation or whether it is censorship. Yeah. No, that's a great question. So let me let me try to answer that in two ways. One is to try to note a broader. This doesn't quite speak to precisely your point, but I think it's there. Um, which is that I think there's a broader tradition that has gone under-recognized of informal, at least outside of Russian language spaces, um, of informal regulation of networks. Uh, um, I know that in recent years there's been some explicit talk about throttling or, or blocking uh, certain sites, but I think 
what's really notable is that for the first you know 15 20 years after uh, the fall of the Soviet Union the internet was of was unregulated uh, formally unregulated um, uh, but that doesn't mean that there isn't forms of control or bottlenecks or pressure or influence and so I think to understand um, what I'm arguing is that there's actually a larger traditional similarity between the history I outline here and the governance practices that continue um, culturally and informally um, in the 90s and aughts. Um, I know that's shifting a little bit, but let me say also, like in the American space, clearly there's control and regulation and censorship taking place, not in an explicit formal way, but again through the mechanisms of capitalism, right? I mean, to the degree that an ISP you know, regulates your ability to have access to the internet, um, that's, that's, a, that's a product of a corporation, of a commercial entity being given control over the pipes um, that, that bring you signals. Um, so it's, I wouldn't argue that there's a sense of it's a different type of control. And it's a control I hint to at the end of the book when I try to express my deep theoretical and philosophical dissatisfaction with our notions of public and private today. Because I think if you sort of have a control, a sense of public that should be uncontrolled and a sense of private that can be whatever you want, you've already lost the whole hope of a public. Um, and I try, to, I try to change that. For example, like if you just let private control be unregulated, uh, you can have situations such as in Egypt where two ISPs feed the entire country for the most part and thus it's really easy for Mubarak or whoever to actually just ask the CEOs of, co of corporations to turn off the internet for a couple days. Um, uh, and that would be a form of informal control that's made possible thanks to the commercial or capitalist society. So what I'm trying to say is that I think these longer informal traditions of not quite explicit control exist um, in lots of places, including post-Soviet post uh, transition spaces as well as uh, post-Cold War America. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure there's other things to say too. But. Switching gears very, very slightly. Please. I'm, I'm always captivated by the knot in this title, yeah. uh, and it's a red knot. Yeah, a red knot. Know. And um, um, it, and and there's always a question of a certain. Um, I mean, you're talking about a network that didn't happen, and you're outlining some very reasons, uh, some some archival reasons for some evidence that you found for why it didn't happen. There might be also other stuff that we will never have access to because right. the, you know the memory is complicated and notes are imprecise and uh, technologies are also um, sometimes uh, fairly fickle. Um, so, do you believe that this kind of network was actually possible? That's a great question. I have no idea how to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let me let me be clear. The knot is not a normative argument against Glushkov right. or that particular technical design. It is a strongly normal, normative argument against informal institutional avarice in all of its forms. Like I'm quite happy to take that one on. And I think the reason that the, the Ogas couldn't have worked was not because of its, of its technical design, but because of the institutions that were trying to support it. Um, I think if it existed in the Soviet military, for example, there would be a very fine chance that it could have been constructed. Mm -hmm. um, because there you have very clear silos of funding, very clear directions. Uh, the institutional groundwork is very different than the tumultuous treadmill of reform that is the economic bureaucracy. So, um, yeah, I love, I love the question. Um, and, let, I mean, actually we were talking about this maybe the other day, but let me say that I, I read this not as a historical tragedy, but as a literary one, mm -hmm. in the sense that I really don't care what the outcome was, and I'm not here to defend mm -hmm. any particular imagination. But it's a tragedy in the sense that for the people who were building it at the time, mm -hmm. you know, their best ambitions were uh, undone 
by the conditions of their being, not even their ideas, but just the fact that they existed in certain environments. And I think that's that's a that's a kind of literary tragedy. I'm not yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah, the reason I was actually thinking about this um, is because I remember very clearly, I think this was in the early 2000s, at some point there was an article, I, I want to say it's in the New Yorker, where there was an article that said, dot communism. Right. Right? Yeah. And that was the, the hope, that was the vision. And we've already brought this up somewhat, that you know, no, totally. the internet's going to open everything. And somehow the communist idea came to mind that, you know, um, you can now trade music. You right. can now do all of these things. Right. It's amazing. And then, um, you know, this was the era where Napster existed right. in its form of, you know, free downloads. And of course, um, in Russia, this is a more complicated question because free downloads uh, reign su supreme despite uh, attempts at regulation. But um, right. uh, that did close up that idea that you know people can willingly trade in whatever goods they want to trade in and if you want to send music you send music and if you want to send art you send art and, um, right so uh, in thinking of that transition and then the tightening that mm. happened afterwards with the internet and the privatization of it right and the partitioning uh, I can't almost help but think that you know like if 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 we're going to play the hypotheticals game, right? yeah. if the Soviet network actually yeah. came into being, there would emerge, you know, there are ways of um, of closing it or still creating modes of exclusion, yeah. uh, new types of elites, and all of these things that we're observing. So, um, you know, almost a kind of um, uh, uh, an kind of an evolution of a network argument uh, begins to present itself here, right. to my right. mind. I don't right. know if this is kind of too hypothetical. To no, no, I love it. Um, I it never. <laughs> <laughs> so let me let me just riff for a little bit and see if this this makes sense. Let's do what historians are trained never to do, right. which is to <laughs> admit <laughs> admit to counterfactual. This is every dissertation advisor in my mind is screaming at me right now. <laughs> Thou shalt not say the following things and permit the Ogas to have existed another 10 or 15 years, right? Say it somehow, through magic, like managed to come to be. What we might have actually had at the start of the aughts when the dot communist stuff was happening, which is actually, in, there's an earlier tradition of this, um, commons discourse, uh, the kind of, you know, you're never quite sure if you're listening to uh, 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 Eric Raymond or Trotsky, Trotsky uh, at times when they're talking about like the communalist collectives that are quite possible. Um, uh, we would have had in the early aughts two extraordinarily different versions of uh, dot communist networks. And I think that would be sufficient. Like that, that's already the unbearable difference that we're looking for that really history wants, right? You would have had a prolonged s state socialist uh, project that calls itself communist and that has a network at its core. And then you would have had this like hyper hyperbolic, uh, politically charged internet discourse that is also trying to take advantage of the collectiv collectivity baked into network sharing. And you would have, they would have been profoundly, profoundly different. And there's a lot of things about the Glushkov Ogas project that are just, well, I'm, as a person, not as a scholar, really glad they didn't come to be, right? I mean, there's lots of things that make me nervous about it. Um, so I want to not defend it. Uh, well, I mean, so I think one of its earliest uh, proposals was to gather. Um, 60,000 dossiers on individuals and corporations. I mean, this is one of the reasons I'm against it is because I'm against, uh, you know, the uh, NSA, <laughs> right? I'm against uh, the massive surveillance of people um, beyond, beyond their permission. In fact, if I could try to like say a little bit towards what I try to make in the conclusion a little clearer, I think, um, a kind of the Cold War discourse itself is baked, at least in the West, around a kind of economic liberalism, right? That permits us a really um, toxic way of talking about public and private. So public is associated with the state, private is associated with corporations. I think if that's your trajectory, if that's your coordinate system, 
there really there can't be a healthy conversation at some level. And in the conclusion, I try to pivot um, 90 degrees or some degree to Hannah Arendt's arguments. She's, if you don't know her, she's probably the major political theorist of the mid 20th century, um, uh, who argues uh, for a kind of classic Aristotelian notion between the private and the public, where the private is the oikos, coming from the Greek for a private household, and is also related to our word economy. So the private is that which, where you see a, a household, whether it's a state or a corporation or the social, she calls it, anything that wants to bring into its own private space. Um, and she posits that against the public, where the public is, and this would be a great thing to try to figure out how do you actually get networks to build a space where people can use words to create action. So her idea of a public is a space where voices have traction, where there's consequence to speaking. Um, and and that, that type of, I, I, I recognize that she's an idealist and there's lots of problems with that, but um, nevertheless, there's something I think promising in reorienting our vocabulary and saying, okay, what would a network that actually rewards consequential speaking look like? And by the way, I don't think it's free speech. Like, I'll just go out there and say, like, I don't think free speech, I think free speech is, how, is what happens when you run speech through economic, liberal, philosophical thought. You get like liber, liberated free speech. I'm not in favor of censorship at the same time. Um, I'm interested instead, can we find ways of making speech valuable? Can we find ways of making speech moving, right? Uh, um, of having consequence in the world. And I think there are ways of doing that, but they're not ways that are obvious in either end, ideological end of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And this is what Arendt, of course, saw in like 53, <laughs> as Sputnik was, like her preface is about Sputnik, actually. So, anyway, please. I'm very interesting topic, and actually, I read your article in the journal on communication traction. Oh, wonderful. Information traction. Then, I think that actually, the question about the subject of this journal because it's just a normalizing function of uh, uh, this system of uh, networking, which, which is not clear to me. What it means normalizing. Yeah, that's um, interesting. And have a comment, maybe. Yeah. Just uh, expressing it. Because I think it's a really interesting subject. Is that, uh, I agree with your argument, so I'm not completely right. But I think that it might be interesting to study the law of uh, communication and information in this field of party regulation. Because particularly, as I heard from some of my colleagues from party archive and party historians, Because of uh, lack of support by party for 
this uh, system of automatization. Mm -hmm. It was very sometimes not talking. No matter in the different no matter in this limited options, and particularly it was a period of perestroika. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, I, uh, let me just kind of riff a little bit off, off these wonderful comments. Um, I would just offer that in your comments are the seeds of a really lovely uh, additional history and something that needs to be added. And I hope that you'll approach the book as an invitation for critique and precisely that. My story basically ends in 83 and it's very specific. It's as specific as my archives permit. Um, and there's a lot, a lot more work that needs to be done to kind of update that. And I'm also like, I am in very, I'm in a lot of rooms where people talk about the history of technology, but I am very rarely in rooms where people talk about encountering stories about the failure of the history of technology. And I, uh, I think it's actually a massively important uh, and instructive genre. Like I think. Um, so there's a problem with failure in the term and I think it's that it appears that the opposite is success and that's that that's not the case right but what's really interesting I think about failure is that it permits a much broader view of what counts in the history of technology right and it permits us to you're asking about normalizing let me come back to that in a second but it normalizes the normal experience of technology. I don't know about you, but half the time my computer is broken, right? And the other half, my cell phone isn't connected. Um, and this is, you know, in the era of smart devices, right? Uh, when a lot of, um, uh, um, and I, I think another way of seeing this is that, here's a metaphor. Have you ever been in a cemetery? Like you're walking around a graveyard, right? And instead of seeing dead, you know, stones and monuments to dead pasts, you actually look around and you see what often happens in cemeteries is because they're quiet, still spaces, they become overgrown. They become rich, like abounding in interesting forms of life. And I think I would love if people would take the history of technology with failure or passing or death as kind of like an invitation to think about overgrowth. How, in fact, in these histories, we can find alternative paths, how we can find alternative connections. Um, so I'm, I'm not speaking specifically to your question, but uh, back to why I argue about normalizing. Um, to the degree I think I understand the question, I am, I'm interested in a history of practice. Um, like, how is it that these institutions actually try to respond to the proposals, to the network proposals? Not what was the technical design and architecture for the proposal, for the computer network itself, but how did the, who said who to what, when, and how? And why did they say what they said? And can we describe that as a, pe a person activity? And if we do that, then I think we can normalize what becomes institutions. Um, uh, and as for automation, yeah, that's that's a great great question. 
Um, I just would note that um, somebody uh, has just published a piece trying to connect Uskarenia to the 1960s Soviet cybernetic vocabulary, uh, which is interesting. So I'm not sure if Gorbachev is is aware or if there's actually a legacy, but that somehow Uskarenia is actually a, the most obvious technical uh, kind of program in in that 1980s moment. But I, I, I am glad to leave that to others who know far more than I do. So now I'm not for COVID. Right, because normalization is associated with Foucaultian approach, which is Foucault. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't assign myself as Foucaultian. I mean, I learn a lot from him. I think, I think the idea of rupture in history is really powerful, um, but I don't, I don't see it as essential. Right? Normalization. Yeah. Yes, I see now your perspective. Okay, yeah. So... Any questions? Is, I kind of want to jump in, but I always want to jump yeah. in, so I want to let people do their jumping before I. Uh, I have start questions for you, my, uh, so if, if if can I even sure, s like yeah, like no no like <laughs> we, we can out host each other. Like I would love to learn about what you're interested in too. So be careful, I might ask you questions. It's a maybe a threat. <laughs> yeah. May I? Yeah, please. I think I was connected that um, the notion of censorship and yeah. uh, I'm, I'm just interested if it was an issue for this project of this Soviet uh, network, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how, how it was discussed, of course. And, um, and the second question um, is connected with the archives. What, uh, what kind of archives? Yeah, is totally. Well? I'm just sure. Could we hand the book over? Is the book still around? Let's let's just circulate it this way, because um, the appendices give like the specific answers. Um, but uh, I love the question. And by the way, as a Westerner who's always encountering people and talking to them about my work, that is the number one assumption. People say, "Oh, well, it was censorship. It was culture of secrecy. It was a closed culture. So of course there couldn't be a network." It's not what I found, um, and that's not what the history bears out, at least um, in this sense. Um, <coughs> the people that we've been describing, this isn't a people's history in some way, it's a very elite history. Um, and the people who, have, um, who are working on these network projects have top secret security clearance, they have access to a lot of uh, uh, specialized knowledge, um, Glushkov is actively involved in military industry uh, production, and so he's he seems to have basically access to whatever knowledge he needs. Um, so to, de to the degree that censorship is a knowledge question, I think it's supi surprisingly irrelevant in this history. But if you want to talk about censorship as a form of informal power or a way of throttling f finances or making political decisions, then absolutely. Of course, this would be, in that broader sense, something to do with cens censorship. But in terms of explicit formal control over the expression of knowledge, I think what's really interesting here is that um, it's not that that Western assumption is, is really misplaced. Um, so, and, but it's not the only one. I mean, people would, you know, uh, the next assumption is that, well, the Soviet economy and state was clearly hierarchical. Right? So there just this assumption that anything that's centralized um, couldn't possibly produce a sustainable network. I mean, I, I don't detail this in my presentation, but a, a bulk of the book is showing how in practice, I'm not sure if that's the normalizing, but in practice the, the economy is interestingly not just centralized, right? It's in many ways informal. So again, there's another Western assumption that doesn't really fit. Um, so yeah, some, something like that. As for the archives, uh, what's, what's the quip? I mean, I think Marshall McLuhan, do you guys know Marshall McLuhan? As uh, a founding media theorist, he once quipped that uh, the first thing you need to know upon visiting Russia is that there are no phone books. By which he meant, if you arrive without contacts, 
you're, you're up a creek, you're in trouble. And that's precisely what I did. Nimonoshka Resperaris Podwiski, and I arrived in 2007, kind of with this idea of searching out the Soviet internet in Moscow. Oh man, I couldn't get anywhere. I mean, I had a, I was at MGU. It, it was like I was well positioned. The archives were, a, it was a hard slog uh, those first couple of years. Um, then I contacted Slava Gorovich, who's uh, written the founding article uh, behind this book. Um, and, and I said, hey, I'm in Moscow, sitting like 100 meters from the archives that I can't get into. What do you suggest? And he's like, oh, here's a draft of my article that's going to come out. You should read it. Also, you should contact these people in Kiev. So I reached out to the people in Kiev, and then a year later I was invited to Kiev where not only the archives were open, but like archives that weren't archives were made open to me. So I, I had dozens of interviews in Moscow and Kiev and access to the National Academy of Sciences, as well as the local university, as well as the Institute of Cybernetics archives, um, as well as an archive that was just like a closet full of papers, like that nobody had bothered to sort. So that was really um, interesting. So, I, I mean, it, here's another way of saying this. The archive is the, that is the story. It always is in history, right? And I thought this was going to be a history about um, computer networks, but it ended up, at least methodologically, being a story about interpersonal networks or about, you know, who, who's connecting with whom. And I should note that Moscow, um, although there was simultaneously a graduate student, Alexei uh, Kutienikov, uh, whose dissertation was seminal for this this project. Um, he wrote about the Ogas project uh, at MGU in the history of science and is now in, working in a bank, which I think is somehow just tells the whole story. <laughs> he discovered the source of power. <laughs> that's, that's just the story right there. That the, the major historian of the Ogas in Russia today works in a bank. Yeah. Yeah. So critiques of capitalism abound. Uh, yeah, so something like that. <laughs> and there, yeah, details in the back. You could specify what distinguish your book from the book of Slava uh, Gerovich. Yeah, no, sure. So his is an article. It's about 15 pages long, and it makes uh, the sort of preliminary question available. So I, I was pursuing, the, in my defense, I was pursuing the question before he had published. I was in Moscow when he told me about his not yet published article. Um, uh, uh, and the other major part is the Ukraine story, which he didn't know anything about. He had encountered, um, his, his story is largely told through the perspective of cybernetics, which is also my entryway. Um, and it ends up being largely a Moscow-based uh, reflection on what he could tell from the cybernetic literature. Um, my story is dozens of art, dozens of interviews and yeah, half a dozen archives um, about, about the Ukraine story. So basically Glushkov is not mentioned, for example, in, in Gorovich. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Because it was exactly society after Stalin's death, it was society which tried to find the moment, 
Right, right. So it's just like they're trying to the lines to dissolve any human connections between Perfect. I will happily distinguish them for you. So, um, thank you. Uh, I agree that Gorovich kind of makes that argument, and I also think it's wrong. I don't think that um, I don't think that it's possible to ascribe the the inability of a country to develop a network thanks to uh, vertical uh, uh, communication networks. I think um, that kind of hierarchical or vertical uh, description or register actually undercuts and doesn't let l us describe what is actually implicit in a network, which is a series of not vertical or hierarch um, n nothing that can be described in a hierarchy. So I don't, um, maybe I could talk more about this, but uh, I use the idea of heterarchy. Uh, which is actually a cybernetic idea to describe, I think, something that is not linear, uh, a set of communication networks uh, in the in informal economy, in the state bureaucracy, I can back up one. You can see in the kind of design of the Soviet uh, bureaucratic spaces, there's a hierarchy on the left, a hierarchy on the right, but the middle, the heart, um, I argue, is very interestingly not hierarchical. This is a hetarchy. Uh, the the minister the ministries are going through rapid transformations and reforms continuously. Um, sometimes there's twelve, sometimes there's thirty five, uh, you know, a few a few years apart from each other. And that kind of tumult, that turnover, I think allows us. I'm hoping you can help me describe an organizational condition that is far more complex than either vertical or horizontal or uh, you know top-down or otherwise. Um, so McCulloch, just as a simple definition, says that a heterarchy is any environment that cannot be described by one logic. Right? It is a set of relations whose sim doesn't have a single regime of evaluation. That, uh, right, that you may be my boss, but I... Um, I, I'm your landlord, right? And so that there's this kind of like not clear hierarchical, it's not a stable relationship. And it's in these moments of heterarchy that I think we can begin to describe neither vertical nor horizontal, but the really interesting spaces of negotiation. Uh, David Stark calls it entrepreneurialism, but I think that kind of puts a positive spin on what is just human behavior. Uh, how it is that we negotiate the messy relations. Um, and I think that messy relation, that organizational design, speaks much more clearly uh, to me than either... I mean, Gorovich, God bless him, he's... he's I, just it feels a little too uh, post-Soviet. I mean, he's, he's, he's reacting. He's saying, like, they, they couldn't have possibly gone there right, and because it's the opposite of the thing that did get it right. And I think that's not the case. Um, that the organizational, uh, that it's not a binary. I don't know if that is clear, but let me keep working on it. It's a wonderful question. Um, I owe him a lot, but I don't think the arguments are the same. Well, I think we've uh, kept you well, thank you. Quite busy for the yeah. past hour and a half, uh, but if there are no more pressing questions, I think we will thank uh, Ben once again for a wonderful presentation and for fielding all of the questions. Oh, thank you. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it.